Welcome back. We are here with the Troponin episodes, episode 25. We are Team Troponin. Friendly reminder, if you're enjoying these podcasts, like, subscribe, turn on notifications, drop us a comment, and you can always find more of this content at teamtroponin.com where we're continually adding more and more content to be delivered. Um, also, leave us a comment and let us know your family's weird Christmas or holiday traditions. Uh, apparently, we started that last week and got a couple fun comments. So I think we're going to kick off tonight's episode with a question that Justin, one of Justin's clients asked in a question in a check-in. So, uh, yeah, so client asked me about, I think it was really just, what are your thoughts on Mike Menser? You know, but I know obviously what he meant, like high intensity training, you know. And so I think that's a good one because I think that's a like his logical conclusions are an easy mistake, I think, to make. And I think they are our mistake. I think, you know, like because, you know, one of the best ways to to, you know, logically work through something is called, you know, reductio ad infinitum, which is basically, you know, take it, take the whatever you're doing, extrapolate to infinity as far as you can take it. You know, and when does it break down or does it hold? You know, and it, it, it can be a helpful tool, but it can really get you in the wrong position, I think. And I think that's what he did. I think he was correct in, in thinking that obviously people were using too much volume back then. You know, there wasn't really the the, the studies to prove it, but it, it seemed like, you know, I mean, if you knew nothing about working out or bodybuilding, you would think how much time you spend in the gym is directly re- correlated to how you look. You know, that's a pretty easy, you know, intuitive thing you think from day one. But quickly you learn that there's more involved. You know, you need to eat to grow. You need to recover to grow. And and you would realize that, you know, maybe on, on times when you don't, you're not working out four hours a day because of other work requirements or something, your growth doesn't slow. So real quickly you'd learn like, okay, where where is this point now? And I think his problem was that he went the wrong way with it. I think he took... I think he basically started like infinite volume is too much and worked his way down. And I think it's real way too easy to slingshot past the correct amount. And I think we've kind of talked about this before. I think if he took basically the same logical steps and he was an Ayn Rand guy, you know, and I think he got into amphetamines late in his career too. And those tend to lead you down real pigeonholed paths if you, if you let them. Uh, but I think, you know, he took the approach of like, you know, four hours a day or, or three hours twice a day is too much and worked his way down until he, he went too far, where it was, you know, too low volume. And I think that's an easy mistake to make if you go from that direction. If you take the other direction, I think it's much more logically intuitive, meaning if you do zero sets, you're not going to grow. And obviously, one set is going to produce more growth than zero sets. One higher intensity set seems logically to produce more than, than one light intensity set. And we've done this before. You know, two sets would be better than one. Three is better than two. But already you, you, you know, th- like on like squats or something, if you're doing legs and your only leg work was squats, and that's your only movement, already you're kind of the point like three all out sets, not counting warm ups. You could already get to the point where you're like, ah, is that, you know, my, like a fourth set of 405 for 20. Am I even going to recover? You know, so very quickly you get to that point. Now, as bodybuilders, we're doing more than just training a movement, we're training multiple body parts. You know, when you train your back, you need to adequately hit all all the muscles of the back to make sure everything grows evenly. So it's going to get more than that. But I think coming from that approach, you'll, I think you'll more likely settle on a a better logical volume amount of that. Yeah. Well, obviously when I did one set, I grew faster when I did zero. When I did two, I grew faster than one. But once I got to maybe, I don't know, 10 working sets for, you know, a body part, maybe even less six. Well, really, if you're doing working sets, probably definitely less, but you know, you get somewhere where you're like, once I, you know, I did six sets and then I, I did seven sets for a few weeks and I didn't notice any better growth. And then I did eight sets. I didn't notice any better growth, nine, 10, 11, 12. And I realized that there was no increased rate of growth anywhere from six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, or however high I went. So somewhere in that range, and I can't know exactly, and it's going to be intensity dependent. It's going to be recovery dependent. It's going to be dependent on other variables, but somewhere in that range, I'm probably optimizing growth. And at that point, somewhere in that range, I should now switch my focus to recovery and diet, where I think he did the opposite, where it was, you know, I, you know, I don't see any reduced rate of growth when I do three hours a day of training versus four or two hours versus three or one, you know, and the, I think you get to that and well, you start, you start seeing a direct pattern and that pattern drags out a lot farther with our, with our approach from the zero percent, you know, the zeroth approach, you know, it doesn't, it only takes a few steps before you see that you can't you can no longer take that logical step further because you know the progress isn't changing where you go the other way there's a long way you can go you know because 
you know, doing 30 sets, you know, 29 sets, you're not going to see uh, less growth. 28, you're not going to see 20. You know, you can keep going and keep going. It's, I think it's easy to let yourself get caught up in that and take it to where he did at the end, which was far too far, trying to find that optimal uh, training volume, which I don't think there is. You know, and I think you're, you're risking too much on the downside if you go, if you try to get too close to that. You know, what's the penalty if you train with too much volume? You just have to make sure you're able to recover better. You know, the penalty if you do too little volume is you're not, pro you're not progressing. That's a much bigger downside than just needing to maybe rest a little bit more. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, <laughs> if we're kind of working in the, the paradigm of, of progressive overload and just treating your progress on a movement is kind of a proxy for growth, which I think works most of the time, kind of like DC training. You can kind of inverse the question and ask, how do I know when I'm not doing enough or when I should add volume? Mm -hmm. And again, they're making a lot of assumptions here, but if you ask yourself that question, the answer is probably when you actually don't make progress. Like if, if one set to failure per muscle group, you know, for an entire week is not enough, I mean, just if you have a little bit of experience and just you can hear that that number and be like, okay, that's that's not enough. Um, now, I guess it gets a little more complicated when you try to factor in, like, should I even be taking all these sets to failure, et cetera? But I think that's that's a good rule of thumb. What do you think? I think it's hard, too, because if you're, if you're not super objective or you don't have someone who's giving you direct input, it's hard to know if you're actually growing. Um, it's hard to know if it's actual tissue growth or if it's just yeah. holding a little extra water or if you're adding fat. So especially kind of deep in the off season, you're not making huge, huge, you know, massive tissue gain unless you're Dave. Um, it's, I think it's really hard to know um, if you're actually growing. Yeah. So I kind of go with the, if things are progressing, um, I probably tend to underlay things a little bit more. And I tend to find that my clients, they want more volume than they probably need. <laughs> and that's, that's the, the hard people, It's people. This is, this is like, this is our, the hobby we enjoy. It's like telling someone who right. is obsessed with golf, you know, not to golf every weekend, you know, right. they would be like, right. yeah, maybe I'll be a better golfer, but I'm never going to be, a, well, you know, I want to play golf you know, or I want to play whatever my, my, you know, my passion is. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's a sweet spot too, to where I've had people I've had to say, Hey, like, I know you want to do more, but I think there is an optimal, optimal as a range dosing where, you have to think about if you're constantly running relatively high volume year round, at some point your minimum effective dose is going to be so much higher than it probably yeah. needs to be. And so your maintenance volume is going to be high. That makes it really, really hard to maintain progress on a period where like, let's say you're traveling, it's holidays or things just get crazy um, for a couple of months. And I think it's really that's kind of, that's yeah. kind of an interesting too. Cause that, that is, you know, cause you can, cause I've gone through phase I've done both ways when I, early on, I kind of went the mentor way on my own and, and because I was mis, uh, mistaking strength progress, especially early in my lifting career, where a lot of that strength progress comes from you know, neurological adaptations, I was mistaking strength progress with actual progress. And because I'd realized like, well, if I cut out all these sets and focus just on these few sets, I'm continually able to get stronger. You know, and at that time in my career, it largely is probably likely because there's just not all the additional fatigue to deal with. I'm able to get into a groove but then also, you know, like, like you said, with the higher volume, I've gone in cases where, because uh, you do adapt to that, you know, you adapt yep. to that volume and you're able to, rec and so you can mistake that as progress, where really you just, it, you know, it's like, just because you, you know, if you train a lot running for long distance running, you can adapt to a really high workload, or, but that doesn't automatically going to correlate to a better race time. And right. a lot of cases, a, a very common thing with, because running is really addictive, and I think we talked about this, similar to bodybuilding, a common thing, is, especially in females, is you'll get like a, a freshman cross-country runner who does incredibly well, and she's very, very dedicated, extremely hard work ethic, and you think, oh, by the time she's a senior, she's going to be setting straight records. And what happens a lot is their, you know, their, their times will start dwindling off because they'll refuse to back down their training volume. You know, they, they'll under eat and they'll, because, they, because they've able to adapt to those incredibly high running numbers and, and training volume, you know, that adaptation is mistaken for adaptation in the way you want to adapt. Yeah. I think what's interesting, and, and we've talked about this before, but we're basically making a case for periodization. And I think that we've talked a little bit about how you two tend to be more of a like, you know, just continue to progress and it's probably going to be okay. Um, I probably tend to periodize things a little bit more just because I'm a, big nerd, um, especially with training, but yeah. I, I think we're building a case for it where if you're not resensitizing at some point, 
um, you will probably hit a wall in terms of how much you can continue to progress at your current workload with a given intensity. I, f I feel like I still do periodize. I don't really try to plan it, but, but yeah, I mean, volume has to undulate a little bit, mm -hmm. but I mean, for me, it kind of undulates between very low and then I guess what people might consider to be moderate. I never go very high volume because I always want to take most sets to failure, but I think we all kind of have another gear to shift into in terms of what you can do in one set when we know we've only have like yeah. you know, a single digit number of work sets the entire workout versus if I take that up a little bit to maybe like, I don't know, 12, 14 work sets for the whole workout, I can still say they were all a failure, but there's a, there's a little bit of a difference there. Yeah, and so, definitely. And if anything, I actually, I think I tend to feel a little bit more beat up and volume's a little higher just because it's a little bit more, more wear and tear. Um, I think people associate like feeling beat up with, with just like heavy weights and going to failure. But in my experience, volume is far more a driver of that. Mm -hmm. um, especially if technique, it, you know, slides a little bit. If you're doing two work sets for a movement or for a whole muscle, then being off with your technique and grinding away to joint for two sets is a lot different from doing the same for four sets. Oh, um, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say, I mean, we know that we know that volume is a major driver of fatigue. We also know that under fatigue, um, there's decreased, um, oh my God, my brain, there's decreased coordination of smaller muscle groups across joints. And so it's going to mean that there's probably going to be some sort of a small shift in technique, which is also going to create, you know, tension going or stress being reallocated to yeah. different, different areas. Yeah. I feel like there's also something to say here for using like body composition as, as a marker and maybe even as a a reason to increase or decrease volume. And I know we've talked before about how you don't really want to think of your training as like, as a, a way to burn calories. So to speak, when you're training, you want to perform, get stronger, et cetera, and think about building muscle, not burning calories. But that being said, it does, know, burn calories. <laughs> yeah, it, it does, burn, it does burn calories. And I think if you, if you let volume get too low, I think you probably will start to see a shift in body composition for the worst, or at the very least you'll see, you know, water retention creep up over the course of a week, two weeks, three weeks, and then that eventually turns into fat gain. Um, so that's like another reason why I would enjoy it. Cause I'll go like on a tear with like super low volume where every lift will progress really well. And my weight won't really increase that much, even though food's really high. And then I'll kind of hit a wall where that stops working so well and like weight will start to creep up and I will start to feel really bloated. And oftentimes that's a good time to go ahead and increase volume. Um, and maybe even focus like a little bit less on driving the weights up, maybe try to kind of stabilize things at a certain level and do a little bit more volume at the current strength level. So when you add, like, do you usually add a movement or do you add extra sets to what you're currently doing? It's like a little bit of both. It's never like, it's, it's never a huge shift, but it'll, I'll go from like two straight sets for a movement and even one in some cases to maybe like always at least two straight sets, if not, one straight set and then one back off of that is you know a cluster or rest pause or something that is this so, essentially the stimulus of two or more some sets extension yeah. basically that and then maybe add a movement here and there like maybe i did two movements for triceps the whole day because they were both balls to the wall and i go to three or something like that but uh, but you know if you look at the overall workload that's basically going from an effective eight or ten sets up to like 15 which is a pretty substantial increase yeah i mean it's doubling yeah really but and i think that when you're looking at volume and works up per session it's also important to remember that an extra couple work sets of a smaller muscle group is not the same as adding, you know, an extra set of a TRO yeah, rest sure. style. So yeah. I think even beyond just looking at number of work sets per session, it's a question of where are those coming from? Yeah. I mean, if you go from doing like three straight sets for quads every week to doing uh, two straight sets and three sets that are like clusters, you <laughs> will, you will notice it metabolically in a, within a couple of weeks, I think. Yeah, for sure. Another thing to consider is the fact that, you know, nothing exists in a vacuum. And so, you know, you, an argument for, you, cause you could work, if you use the calorie, you know, line of thought into really high volume, that allows you to push a lot more nutrients through the body, which also has some correlation, obviously, to, to your growth rates. An example, that would be like Milos with his, uh, with his giant sets, an extremely high volume, uh, not heavyweight at all, where the goal is almost exclusively like sarcoplasm. And I, I don't want to say this and, and bastardize it because, you know, I, I'm like, I just see like secondhand what I see in posts online and stuff. But I remember with Luke Wood, uh, he he was the, one of the first guys that uh, was also doing like the, the rebound focus after a contest with Luke Wood, you know, where it would be, 
you know, very, very high workload as far as sets, pretty low weight, but you know, a lot of giant sets where they would push a low, massive amount of calories to the body during and around training. So. I think it's an interesting point to bring up too is, um, you know, post contest, what do things look like? And I'm going to bring this up because I'm working with two guys right now, very different scenarios where both post contest. One I worked with pre contest and the other one I only started working with post contest and pre contest. Um, the guy that I was working with before, um, I had a really good feel for what his baseline was. And so we've been able to push his volume and choose movements that were really, really good for him um, and kind of really find a sweet spot of volume and intensity. The guy that I did not work with pre-contest only came on post was doing a very, very, very low volume program coming into the show. Um, and it was relatively high intensity, um, but his baseline tolerance for total workload was pretty low. Yeah. So he wanted to do a, you know, a three on one off split um, and we had to get a little bit creative with, <laughs> with problem solving that, but yeah, I was just thinking along the same lines, just about increasing nutrient uptake. Like you always stress building metabolism, especially for, for guys who really need to put on more mass because that's kind of a requisite for it. Plus you want your prep to go well after the off season. So in my mind, you might say that, you know, protein synthesis absolutely caps out at like that, you know, gram per hour, 25 grams per day mark. And if that's your only concern, then you might say, well, X amount of stimulus and training is enough, is enough to achieve that. And so I don't need any more, but if you can do a little bit more volume consistently, or at least over certain portions of the off season, and you compare, you know, two twins, they're both at the same level of muscle mass and strength, but one of them ends the off season at 6,000 calories a day. And the other ends at 4,500 because training volume is so low. The first guy's going to have a much easier prep. Yes. Yeah. And world difference. I mean, that's three pounds of fat per week calorie difference you know mm -hmm. at, at at equal calorie amounts i mean that <laughs> anyone's been on a diet knows if you if you have an extra 1500 calories a day to play with it's a it's a different ball game and as far you know not just hunger levels but energy levels what you're able to do with the changes you're able to make how deep you're able to keep carbs and fats in on the diet i mean well you guys have seen like from your first diet to especially <laughs> david with the size he's put on you know like eventually it's when you it's the best thing like my favorite thing about the sport really uh is when you make that transition where prep t goes from how much you know, like hunger pangs can i tolerate mm -hmm. to how precise can i be with the diet because hunger isn't the single highest driving factor you know it's still there you're hungry you're tired and fatigue is kind of always there you can't avoid that but it's more how precise can I be with everything rather than just like, Oh my God, can I, can I make it through today? I'm so hungry. Yeah. survive. Yeah. yeah. I'm really curious too. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, Justin, since we're talking about training volume. Um, if we think about like the pre-contest phase and then transitioning into a prep, what are your thoughts on how to handle training? I mean, I have a couple ideas, but I'd really love to hear what both of you think on how to handle training before starting prep, knowing that whatever baseline volume and intensity you're at, it's going to be tough yeah. to maintain, to that too, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, as you're getting the last few weeks. And especially if you're doing an extended, like if you're going to multiple shows and you say you've got 22 weeks coming up or something, mm -hmm. that's tough to manage. That, and that's the good question because the, like the worst thing as a coach is when is everyone's motivation at peak levels for a prep? The month or two before prep starts, okay. everyone yeah. wants to start prep early. Everyone wants to bring calories down early. Everyone wants to add cardio early because they're ready to get going. And that's the hardest thing is get, reminding people that, you know, everything in due time, because that's the first thing everyone wants to do is, you know, I'm 20 weeks out. I'm ready to start tightening it up. It's like, I know you are now, but <laughs> you need to be ready to continue tightening it up in, tw in five months or I'm ready to start cardio now. It's like, well, I know you are, but remember, we're not going to get to back down cardio until you're stage ready, and, which is probably not going to happen early because it, no, it's very difficult to get stage ready. So what I kind of like to do is not, I don't like to really change much with training. I, I don't, because I don't, I, I recommend, you know, if you can take a deload, you're going to take a week off, anything like that, it's in that four week period before prep. And I typically recommend people cruise, which correlates usually to a reduction in intensity and volume a little bit also, but not uh, really not much with training, probably a slight reduction, uh, but, but really not much, but I mostly don't want people to think that increasing volume and prep is the way to go because that never works because again you want to start doing that at 16 weeks out or whatever where motivation sky high and if you're you know we can't just remove those calories because we've adjusted the diet based on your 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 energy output you know and so if you're burning all these calories with this crazy high volume you know it sucks but you can't really drop it because if you lose 
400 calories a session in the gym, we have to pull 400 calories out of the diet. And at the end of the prep, we don't have that. Yeah. So it, that, that's my, the, uh, I don't, training is difficult for me because for me, like the diet is the, the best diet is the best diet. And I think I've said this before, you, you know, it's, it's a little more black and white. It's, you know, this diet works, you know, make it taste as good as you can, but this is what works. There's, you don't get to beat around the bush with it. Training's a little different. Training's a little more emotional. So I don't like to force too much, uh, because it's, if people don't enjoy the training, you don't get the most out of the training. And so there's, I would rather someone get like 10% out of alignment with perfection in either direction and training knowing that whatever they're doing and you know they're close to where they need to be but whatever they're doing they're super motivated to do it so they're going to give it their all rather than steer them back to the middle that or whatever i think is the middle and have them dread going and then we lose a lot of the benefit i might have a slightly different opinion on how to approach training very prep or at least the start of prep but i say might because this isn't really how i've tried it yet i think every all my preps, I've just basically kept training the same until I couldn't quite keep it the same, at which point I'd start to dial volume back a little bit mm -hmm. and just try to keep strength as high as I could. But um, I'm kind of stealing from uh, Joe Bennett, hypertrophy coach here. He's mentioned how you actually might want to be at a place at the beginning of a prep to where you have a little bit of wiggle room to increase volume. And that doesn't mean do it emotionally because you're motivated and just go crazy high. It means if you can start at a prep at a point where you have that wiggle room, then by increasing your volume, you can probably keep calories a little bit higher for a little bit longer compared to if it started at a baseline or even lower. And so I guess if you were going to take that approach and say, you probably want to end your, assuming you're going to do a cruise in between, you might want to end your off season at like what would be your peak volume when you're also pushing your food the highest and then go into a cruise phase where you have, you know, drop, probably drop volume as much as you can while still maintaining your muscle mass and your strength and keeping your body composition in a decent place. And, and yeah, just focus on keeping your strength as high so that basically you can start prep. You're now you're gassed up. You've maintained a decent body comp and you have a little bit of wiggle room as far as increasing volume goes. And then you have even more wiggle room to pull it back, say five, six, seven weeks into prep when you start to feel more fatigued. I can yeah. agree with that. Yeah. I can definitely agree with that. That's certainly how I've run for my clients as well, where you can use that kind of first start of prep to almost let them acclimate. And um, later on in prep as energy dips, you can really consolidate and kind of tap into that second gear that you both talked about, where when you know you only have one or two really tough sets in a session, you really can maintain intensity because that's the thing that's going to allow you to maintain the mass. So a lot of times early on in our prep, I'll ramp volume up just a little bit so yeah. that later on we can consolidate as we kind of peak intensity a little bit more. Yeah, I actually find if you, if you approach volume correctly that way i find that like the period between say i don't know 12 and six weeks out 12 and four weeks out for me it actually ends up being a really fun time to train because yeah. i am hungry and i'm getting tired but i'm also able to pull volume back a little bit and so i am it's like it's probably when volume is about as lowest effective dose for growth but i can go into each session and make some strength gains and it becomes like the fun part of prep because you know the rest of the day kind of sucks because you're hungry but at least yeah. you have to look forward to and you get to you know hit prs yeah i think we've talked about that that's that was always my like for me it was about eight to 12 weeks out or maybe eight to 14 weeks out when my all my best all my like the videos you see of me online with really big lists we're almost always in that period because it's like this like perfect storm where you've increased cardio uh you know so your water retention's down your cardiovascular ability is a bit higher so you know so all your sets are really pure muscular failure sets you know when you're a bigger guy when you're 290 pounds it's a lot of mass and high high rep leg and back movements could e can really easily turn into well am i failing because my muscles are done or because my my lungs are done or is it a combo of both and any of those other than just all muscle fail failure is not what you want and then you lose, you kind of looser around the joints. You know, you have a little more flexibility at some of the joints for like a squat or a deadlift. Yeah, so I agree with that. Well, I kind of want to, I want to say with a caveat of where my, like where my thinking is with that. And the other hard thing is whether you're working with someone who's trying to turn pro versus someone who maybe thinks they want to turn pro, but really doesn't understand what it takes is there's, it's all like the butterfly effect. There's a very slippery slope with things. And as an example, I'll use like, someone messing up on their diet and fixing it the next meal, you know, technically that's probably not going to make a difference over a 24 hour period. Your macros and calories are the same. However, 
in your brain, it's now you've now set the stage that, well, if I mess up on the diet, I am able to fix it, which one mess up is not going to affect anything. But at some point it does, you know, is it if you do that every day, probably affecting things, you do it multiple times a day. And it's real. E it's an easy slippery slope because it doesn't happen all at once. You know, it's like, hey, I, you know, I, I missed a meal. So I just combined my next two meals. I still had a great workout. No coach never noticed a difference in my physique. You know, and you don't know how many of those you have, but you do know that if you completely don't follow the diet and just say like, well, I'm supposed to eat roughly this many calories. Let me just throw them in however I want. You know, you're not going to progress as well. And it is, it seems like it's not a slippery slope, but all those things are, you know, we, we do it all the time with, you know, like, I, I don't know, you, 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 like you show up five minutes late for work and no one notices. You're going to show up five minutes late far more often after that. You know, you leave five minutes early, no one notices. You know, like the more you can get away with, you, in the back of your mind somewhere, you know you're able to get away with that. Mm -hmm. And you don't know what the cumulative amount of get away with that is that it stops working. And that's kind of where I'm thinking with the, because uh, I, I was kind of more thinking like increasing volume in prep, like people always want to do that because they think it's going to burn more calories. It's kind of that mm -hmm. same thing where you start thinking like, well, I have this, and I ha I'm able to do this if I need to, to fix something. And which yeah. doesn't work out long term. Yeah. Can we can we ask you? And you you may have. I'm sure you have an answer. Calories burned, like actual calories burned, to create a deficit on an upper body and lower body workout for someone Dave size versus my size. Oh, uh, th quite a bit different. I would Honestly. I would be pretty confident Dave burns over a thousand calories on a leg or back workout uh, in an hour and a half hour. I would I would think probably less than 500 for you, maybe probably quite a bit less than 500. I mean, and God, I don't remember the numbers, but I only ever found like one study on this and I don't even remember how they tracked it, but it was remarkable how much have a, a, just a slight increase in muscle mass and a slight increase in the weight used dramatically increased total calorie output of a, of a workout where it was like, like, once, you know, like you have a 150 pound woman, doing, I don't know, 20 pound dumbbells and she burns this many calories and you think, okay, well, 160 pound man with 40% more muscle for that or 30% more muscle using 30 pound dumbbells. You're like, well, oh, geez, it's 10 pounds more. They weigh almost the same where it was like that little bit of difference was already like twice as many calories oh, burned in training. Yeah. That's and it was also quite a bit more calories than, than anything else. Weight, weight training, I think was the highest per hour calorie burning with no, you know, like no real gu like guides of what the weight training was. So you just have to assume it was some standard workout, you know, two or three minute rest between sets or whatever, where it was dramatically higher than all other forms of cardio. And it's really the, it, it a lot of like, like walking the average, the average American. So I'm assuming that when they say that it's probably like five, nine, 160 pounds or something, whatever that they consider obviously not American then, but the average person, but, uh, it, they burn about 40 calories per thousand steps. And so like people always think like, I'll increase my steps, you know, it's like, you don't burn anything. It, like a, a short female, <laughs> yeah, like, like, like a short female is burning 25 or 30 calories for a thousand steps. You know, you do 10,000 steps. You're only at, you know, you're at a large, a, a, a large yogurt in calories, you know, yeah. for, for 10,000 steps. So like that it's. Well, I bring that up because I think a lot of people very often fall into the fallacy that there are two camps. There's one that's that training burns so many calories and, you know, burning so many calories while I'm working out. And then you hear other people who are like, it's really not all that much. Like the diet's going to be the bigger component. And while they both have elements of truth, um, it is interesting to hear about how many calories someone Dave's size will burn during a, a leg session or back session. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think you would imagine what would you do, you know, hard cardio for, for 60 minutes. You know, you think, you know, what do you, you know, not even hard cardio, you know, moderate cardio at his size, is 100 calories for 10 minutes, you know, so 600 calories in 10 minutes, in, in, in 60 minutes, of not like, not just strolling, but not, you know, not level 10 on the step mill, you know, that's right. 100 calories for 10 minutes is, that's about what I do when I'm doing hit when I don't really push it, you know, I think I used to try to get like 125 or 130 for 10 minutes when I was, I can't even remember now, it's been so long since I tried hard, but it's a, <laughs> but yeah, but you can imagine clearly in an hour and a half workout, well over a thousand calories, but it's also enormously depressing how much fewer calories a female will, will burn in the same time period, which shows up in the diet. I mean, you can really see in the diet difference. Yeah. yeah. That really sucks. Cause despite those huge differences in, in calorie consumption and expenditure, the hunger levels are not yeah, different. Same. And and even worse is a, a male's body is more like 
uh, hormonally uh, adapted to be lower body fat. So, mm -hmm. you know, in, in when you, anytime you get anywhere near single digit body fats, a male's body is still, especially if he's on anabolic, still, no, you know, chugging right along, still looking to hold on to every bit of muscle, still comfortable with burning every bit of excess calories from fat. Where a woman, you get below about 16%, and they're already, you know, hormonally and evolutionarily, they're already thinking, how much do I need this muscle? Because if I get pregnant, I'm not going to survive. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think it's just especially impressive when some of the women's physique competitors get into the show. Oh yeah, and well, and you can see the difference. Like they, they routine, you see women routinely do three hours of cardio a day. Where do like John Meadows going to do cardio? You know, mm -hmm. it's like it's a it's a they're two different sports really. And I, like I, I, I cr like I almost shed a tear sometimes when I send some of the late diets because I feel like, especially it's well, and we don't like the whole coaching industry is terrible because every coach has a couple of videos where they like kind of brag about how they don't got to starve their girls, and it's like you don't have a choice, you know. No one yeah. starves them on purpose, but they don't have metabolism. They burn 1,600 calories a day on their own, and you need to lose, you need to burn 1,000 calories a day to get them in shape on time. That's 600 calories they get to eat. You know, you can make up for it by extra workload, but that's not any food. I think there's a lot of, I mean, we, we all know there's a lot of dishonesty, but even amongst the women's physique competitors, they're like, oh, yeah, I was having like Chipotle leading the show and this, that, and the other. And afterwards, they come out and they say, Actually, I have to change divisions because my body literally wants to go to bodybuilding because I was on zero food. I was on yeah. air the last couple of weeks. Yeah. Okay, well, let's I, have I, I had a client one time. So. I had a, this is years ago. I don't even want to say what sport because I only had a couple turn pro in that that division. But uh, a, a female who went. This is when the forums were on and went. I found her on like four or five different forums bragging, and which is great. It got brought me business, but it was terrible because she was bragging about like eating Subway and, you know. But she basically described however many cheat meals I allowed in the diet. She mentioned only those meals and what she was eating. And I was like, I was like, girl, what, you didn't, what are you talking? <laughs> like, these girls are going to sign up with me now thinking they're going to eat Subway and pizza and get in shape. It's like, no, you can't, you know, you can't cheat how the, so, the physics works. So she's just talking about the meals that make up like two or three percent of all the food. Yeah. 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 It's basically, you know, it's like, yeah, because. I mean, you did get to eat those things, but you got to eat them like, you know, several of those over the course of a prep, you know, eight of them in a 16 week prep or something like that. That doesn't mean you got to eat eight of those every day, but oh yeah. I she... was deep in a prep too. <laughs> I mean, I know. So our, our check-in with you was on Wednesday and I know, so we have our cheat on Saturday usually. And then from, from cheat to check-in is like one half of the week where it's like, okay, just got to be compliant for, you know, those four days or whatever. And then from check-in, to cheat is like a whole second timer, at least in yeah. my brain. I don't know if it is for you, but uh, a little bit. I've gotten less, I've gotten less food focused through each prep. But by the end of this, even this last one, yeah, I was like, just make it to check in, try to get a good check in, and then as long as the check ins, you know, at least reasonably good. It's like motivating. Yeah, it's it's enough motivation yeah. for the, the remaining three days until the cheat meal. Yeah, it's weird the food focus though. Like it's it's an interesting thing. I you know it sucks, but I feel like everyone should tr go through that process because that's how humans existed in most of our mm -hmm. existence. You know, that's how most animals. You go out, you see a deer walking around. That's how they're existing. They're eating tree bark, not because it tastes good, but because they're that hungry. You know, yeah. <laughs> and that's a hunger people don't. You know, like that's hungry because you've been that hungry where a bowl of plain oatmeal looks like apple pie. Oh, you yeah. know, you know it's what I mean? like delectable. Yeah, where it's like bad when you're like, I just want an extra five grams of protein from egg whites. I just want another forty-five grams of egg whites. Yeah, yeah, things that you wouldn't even you would have you would never want to you know like right now when I I'm not dieting at all. It's like a plain bowl of oatmeal. I don't. I can't imagine me being hungry enough to just. To, to eat that, let alone like crave it. You know? I remember doing the point of prep where Dave was making cream of rice and he was rebounding. And I just sat there and I literally burst into tears because I just wanted a bowl of cream of rice. And it was, there wasn't even anything in it. It was just plain cream of rice. Yeah. I remember my very first prep, uh, I, I was at a, working at a hospital. I think my wife came to meet me for lunch and I had oatmeal. And I think, I, I don't know what I was doing. And I was working with uh, a coach, this was years ago, who had me like just zero carb from like 10 weeks out. And like once a week I get like a 50 gram carb meal with oatmeal. And I remember that was that meal. And as I left the microwave, like I stumbled and spilled the oatmeal. 
Oh. And it was it was probably, I mean, there's been some hard times in my life, but that's probably still <laughs> top three worst moments of my life. <laughs> so because I didn't have any other oatmeal on me, no other food. And I was I wasn't gonna just like eat whatever or 50, you know, like in my mind, that was what I was supposed to eat 50 grams of carbs from the Oh, I just stared at it on the floor. I think I probably like tried to scrape. I don't even remember. Like it, yeah. well, I probably yeah. spooned up as much of it as I could. But yeah, <laughs> where now I'd be like, oh, thank God it spilled. I know I can go eat something that tastes good. <laughs> I think this is our this is our first year not prepping together, and I'm really interested to see how it goes. Oh God, I'm gonna. Well, you're gonna be at the tail end of prep, and I'm gonna be at the end of off seasons. So. I know he's gonna be getting like all the cheat meals, and I'm gonna be like, I'm gonna go eat my rice cake and walk outside in the Texas heat now. I guess I'll just eat my meals outside or, or something rice out. cakes rice cakes are the perfect example they are a delicacy late in prep you know oh, like, the, the lightly salted ones. have you done the butter ones the butter flavor ones have the same uh, macros as yeah but i mean yeah. like you know the macro all difference but it's they are they're so good you can hardly stand it if i, I went to go eat a rice cake cereal. right now what's that i make rice cake cereal and oh. when you're in your 10 carb meals, it's literally a rice cake and a half. And you sprinkle some one on cinnamon and pretend it, it's cereal. It's really yeah, sad. Oh, yeah. I'm really excited about it. I'm yeah, this <laughs> this is why bodybuilders become known to lay people as being so crazy. <laughs> it's such a yeah, funny yeah. situation because yeah. the level of hunger that you experience makes sense to drive you crazy, but you're doing it on purpose and yeah. none of them are experiencing <laughs> it. So they're just yeah. looking at you like the weirdo that you are. <laughs> well, yeah, when and like if you're at a at a at a work somewhere where you work and it's the first time you prepped in front of people, they they don't get it. You're like, well, just eat something else. Just yeah, what do you mean? It. Yeah, you could just eat, it could still be healthy. They got salad down at the cafeteria. You know? Yeah, all, all oil is healthy. You just put more olive oil. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Would do. Uh, I have a good one. Did I ever tell you that my dad and chicken? My dad, well, my parents didn't know anything about you know nutrition or anything, and I remember. My dad was eating salads to lose weight, you know, and uh, it was like, a, you know, it was like bacon and a bottle Turkey. of ranch, you know, with cheese. Nice. And uh, and so uh, uh, I think my mom told him, like, you know, like you need protein. He's like, you know, you, you can't just eat salad, and you know that. So my dad to fix the to fix the salad to make it healthy, he just started adding a bunch of chicken strips to, to it. <laughs> But like it was really eye opening because mo- like people don't you you learn people don't know anything about diet they really don't and they get so much misleading information like you see all the time like people you know I couldn't lose weight I wasn't eating enough it's like no that's not how it works at all that's like saying you know like I <laughs> I couldn't run out of gas or, or or you know I couldn't drive because I kept running out of gas because I just put too much gas in the tank or you know or vice versa it's like no that's not how it works well you see that and it's because like sleazy diet salesmen and coaches and stuff, you know, run all the advertisements saying that, you know, like, they, you know, like, you don't have to starve with me, you know, my girls get to eat pizza or any ad, you know, like, you see that all the time, you got to eat more, you know, you weren't eating enough to lose weight. Oh, yeah. Crazy. And especially for females, too, they, everyone wants to play the hormone card. Oh, yeah. it's because your hormones out of whack. And I believe it, like, there's, there's something to be said about that, but it's still within a closed system. Yeah. I always my, my next question is always which hormones like yeah if like is like, it thyroid because there's a there's a real simple pill for that like yeah. it costs nothing yeah it's glandular it's glandular <laughs> yeah that 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 one does kind of bother me because that's like the go to you know like it's it's hormonal or glandular it's like well yeah exactly which which one there's not many thyroid you know are you not making enough testosterone because you don't have much to begin with mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Speaking of that, I have a, I just have a, I have a client who uh, just from cha- starting to work with me, craziest thing ever, uh, just from improving his diet, his uh, his testosterone level is over a thousand. I mean, I want to say, God, he's got to be in his forties. No TRT or anything, yeah. Wow. And his, his blood work is really interesting because it's it's like doubled. His testosterone's like doubled, uh, but his free test is relatively stagnant. His steroid hormone binding globulin skyrocketed. It was really interesting to see the body like try to adapt to this new thing. Hmm. What was the biggest change they made in his, in his diet when he started? Was it just the kicking? Oh, going diet? from like being like the average like like middle management forty two year old man who probably you know drinks almost every night. You know, like 
drinks too much. I don't know what that means, but I've known some plenty of people who drink several, you know, three to four drinks every single night who would, who would not say they drink too much at all. So I'm sure probably more than that. And just terrible piss poor diet, you know, probably very low protein, probably. Uh, and you know, like the weird thing is, is, you know, like high fat would actually help that, you know, testosterone usually, but probably the wrong kind of kinds of fats, you know, too much sugar, his blood sugar was high. I don't remember what his A1C was, but his fasted blood sugar readings were like 140, you know, so wow. he's, 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 he's right. He's broke. His head is several fasted under hundred now, but he's right around hundred on that. You know, and we've cleaned up his diet, you know, obviously completely. And he's eating a higher protein, healthier fats. And we did put fats higher for him because he is, you know, not on anything. And so he's trying to be healthy while also improving his physique. So compared to like most of my diets, it's really pretty, a pretty high fat diet compared to, but yeah, it's really interesting. I'm curious to see what his next blood work will be, like how the body adapts to that and readjusts. But then, cool. what you said about the binding globulin is, is interesting. I feel like I've <clears throat> kind of experienced that myself and heard some <coughs> I think, in that, um, like, I, I had a period where I was on just a TRT dose for well over a year, and I went to get things checked, and my total T was like just over the top of the reference range, maybe, I don't know, 1200. But my um, my free was like several times the reference range. It was ridiculous, and my SHB oh, was really low. Is there something about exogenous tests that that tends to skew that? I wish I your hormones really aren't my thing. I would be that's something that'd be worth looking into. Or I I don't have a real answer for that. This yeah. is my only real experience with like seeing the non endogenous. Or I mean. Uh, yeah, and it's my only experience seeing someone's natural testosterone going like that and how the body responded. I don't have really any other. Usually, it's testosterone only slowly decreases, you know, naturally. So I haven't seen this. I've only, you know, yeah, I have no I idea. If there's something in the something involved in like the normal endogenous feedback loop that drives probably a little bit higher that I was basically bypassing. Yeah, um, that's probably that. I mean, that would that seems logical. I mean, if you do, you know, work it through step by step, that's probably what it is. That's a really good. I'm gonna look that up after this. I think that's a really good. I have no idea. Maybe I just have an amazing response to <laughs> exogenous tests, which I would. But that is, I mean, you won't see SHBG shoot. I mean, you maybe you will, but typically you won't see it shoot. You'll see free test climb with testosterone when someone's you know, on TRT or supplementing with testosterone, you know? And so this is the first time I've seen testosterone shoot up dramatically without supplementation. And, and there was, you know, like some, the body was clearly trying to suppress free testosterone somehow. Yeah. Well, I think that that's yeah, probably we, what we'll cover for the night. Sound good? Anything perfect, else you want to Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. I got to get up in several hours to go pray <laughs> to the passport gods. <laughs> Yeah, we'll uh, we'll create a sacrifice for you, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Live chicken, they said. I don't know if you have one, but preferably <laughs> a live chicken or, or, or goat at the altar. Well, thanks again, guys, for listening. Um, friendly reminder: you can also check out firstattachmentnutrition.com. You can use your your wow use code trope tender on ebooks, shirts, apparel, as well as supplements. Um, and again, like, subscribe, drop us comments on anything you'd like us to touch on. And we often use those for topics. So mm -hmm. thanks for tuning in. Yep. Happy New Year, guys. Yes. See ya. For more content like this, visit www.teamtroponin.com. This video is brought to you by First Attachment Nutrition, Battle Tested Nutrition, Expert Formulated Supplements. Join the First Attachment Revolution.